one and all! Welcome to another exciting episode of Adventuring Academy. I'm your humble dungeon master, Brennan Lee Mulligan. This is Dropout Show, where we talk about all things related to gaming and running games at the table and tabletop and all good things like that. Our guest today, we are so delighted and lucky to have her. She is a television writer and producer who is the author of the Accessibility in Gaming resource. She plays Alindra on Silver and Steel, an actual play that you can catch on D&D Beyond, and is also the co-creator of Monsters and Fables. Please welcome to the show, Jennifer Kretschmer! Hey! Hi. Uh, uh, Jennifer! So me. <laughs> We're delighted to have you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, uh, you share the honor and distinction uh, of, of, much like myself, being a multiple decade member of the D&D Club. You have been playing since you were a wee one, just like myself, who discovered the game uh, in my youth. Uh, uh, how long have you been playing for, and what first introduced you to this marvelous game? So I have been playing almost 20 years um, mm -hmm. and DMing for about 16 of those. Um, I started, the first introduction I ever had to D&D was at summer camp. I went to a performing arts summer camp and they had a D&D &D elective. Um, and a bunch of my friends were really into it. And they're like, it's acting, it's, it's, it's storytelling, it's all these things. And I kind of went and watched one session and it didn't it didn't connect but my brother got really hooked on it my younger brother um and he got into it and tried tried to to teach me and i just wasn't ready i wasn't in the right place for it yet um but in high school i had a group of friends who wanted to start a campaign and at that point i was like yeah let's do it and i stole my brother's books <laughs> and we started playing and i haven't stopped since so it's it's a delight i started with second edition and have been have been playing ever since uh incredible oh second edition um so you your so your first characters would have had thaco they would have had a the bizarre inverse of attack ben, ben bars lift gates oh, oh oh a song from my heart bend bars lift gates <laughs> and when bards had to triple class to get yes it. <laughs> what were the what did you have to be to be a bard to again be a, a rogue a fighter and wizard was it mage thief wizard yes i think, I think it was combo. yes there was an incredible combo this is prior to subclasses in 5e prior to prestige classes in 3.5 um there were just incredibly onerous requirements on you to be this thing which i've i have to be honest i've never fully understood those ability score requirements because in most cases the ability score they require you to have will be one that is very necessary for the class as well it's sort of sort of, sort of like hey if i want to be a wizard with an intelligence of eight i will already be deeply penalized <laughs> you know like, do we need to make it impossible as well? Surely the game can allow. What? Let me be my my you know eight intelligence wizard, my my highly uh, incompetent wizard, please. I want it so bad. Um, but D and D second edition had incredibly onerous standards on a lot of those things. Uh, a lot of uh, non weapon proficiencies. I think weapon proficiencies were like by weapon. In, yes. in a lot of cases. So it's like you have someone that knows how to use a long sword and you hand them a broad sword and they're like, I'm sorry, this is completely lost on me. This is foreign <laughs> to me. I apologize here. Why don't you take that? Uh, <laughs> let's sell it. Let's sell it for gold. <laughs> I mean, do you have any spell books back there? <laughs> anything I might be able to use to help. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, th there was... the, the leveling at different rates for different classes. So when you multi-class, you would be like a level six fighter and a level two wizard at the same oh, time. Oh, yeah, there would be, there. I remember that was very, very challenging. And then in 3.5, they had a thing of like favored classes where it was like one of your classes didn't count, but all the rest had to be within one or two of each other. Um, the youngins with their 5e, I hope they appreciate how streamlined this game, especially when I hear people talk these days about like, oh, you know, 5e is way too crunchy for me. And, and my eyes just boggle being like, oh, the, the horrors of the distant past. This is, uh, this is just the most effortless it could be in terms of the old rule system. Strangely enough, I feel like sometimes in some ways, second edition was super rules light. Like if you look at modules and things, there's there's 
a lot of space in there to, to play with. And I think I'll, for a lot of us, you didn't even need maps and minis at that point. It was very theater of the mind based. Um, you could have them, obviously, because D&D evolved out of wargaming, um, but you didn't have to. And so for me, there was there's so much imaginary play in there that that often now can be adjudicated through rules that have evolved and developed um, because there weren't rules. <laughs> it was, you know, it was there were questions that weren't necessarily resolved in the content you had. But also, I didn't know about modules for years. I only knew about the core books. So I everything I was playing was was original stuff, which yeah. was fantastic. Uh, it was a fantastic way to get into the game. Uh, truly, uh, the the my introduction to the games as well was almost completely homebrew. And even when we did do D and D published material, it was almost exclusively campaign settings with which we would design our own adventures. Right? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, that's so cool. Uh, when you got into D and D at first, um, uh, did you like? Who was DMing? Because you said you've been DMing for like sixteen years. Uh, uh, when you first got into DMing, how long have you been playing? What and what was the thing that eventually motivated you to being like, no, you know what? I'm gonna be behind the screen. I want to lead yeah. my own adventure. It it was we sort of had a rotating DM situation in that campaign. It went on for a really long time, um, and so you know, one person would do a campaign and then someone would sort of do a one shot and then we would go into another campaign. There would be a couple one shots here and there. And so uh, at a certain point we, we started doing more of that and I kind of went, I think I think I would like to do this. I think I would like to try this. Um, and I spent about four months designing a setting, um, had like travel brochures from my towns and every temple had a, a corresponding track, all that stuff. And then the first thing that happened is my players uh, were coming in from having blown up three towns in a row. Uh, <laughs> and they go, we need to talk to the town council. And I went, oh, the town council, ah. which in some ways was the best possible introduction to DMing I could have had because I suddenly had this understanding of, oh, no matter how much prep you do, they're always gonna catch you off guard with something. And you're gonna have to either figure out how to solve it make something up or throw something in their way to give yourself some time you know and that 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 has always stuck with me that i'm so grateful that my very first moment as a dm was absolute sheer terror um, because i didn't know what to do um and and on that one i i handled it differently than i would now but i, I was like you know hand on head out of character I, I'm not prepared. I first, I think, I, first I, they went, they went to a spa. They did a, they did a town council retreat to a spa three days away. You can't get there. You can't go visit. They'll be back in a week. Go away. Like, but eventually, I, I hand on head, kind of went to my players and went, I, I totally didn't think of this, and um, no one told me we were going to be coming from that. So. <laughs> Yeah, just right. go with me. I'm new to this. <laughs> <laughs> this is my first day. You guys blew up three towns. Although I have to say, the idea of an entire town council being like, we're getting reports of some nearby towns getting blown up. This is stressing me out. I say we take <laughs> a weekend. All of us get together. We pack our bags. There's a great resort. It's like a two days Yoga. journey. From Clear our heads. <laughs> <laughs> I really love that. Uh, yeah, it really is a um, it is a deep insight into a what you as a person will do when faced with that sudden kind of the the pressure is is very fun because it's I feel like it's never the PCs putting you on the spot in a malicious way. They're just curious. They just go, well, what's in there? And you have to reach into the spot where you grant yourself a degree of authority, which is honestly counterintuitive and uncomfortable in a lot of ways, where you're like, yeah, I'm gonna make something up right now. And then we could be living with that, depending on how long this campaign goes, for years. This this NPC, like I have to answer this in the moment, come up with an NPC that years from now, one of you could be married to in the game world or could be your arch rival and your greatest enemy. Uh, it's very, it can be like very arresting in that moment, but it's also part of what's so thrilling about the game. Um, as you sort of DM'd more and more, um, 
was this what time period in your life was this were you getting involved in creative work in television and moving in that direction concurrently with yourself as you were playing D D more and more yeah uh, i mean i think oh i'm sorry oh no uh, go for it yeah yeah i think i i um i was always involved in creative spaces i was an actor i was writing um i wasn't really sure what I was doing with my life yet. <laughs> you know, I was in college. So I, I started DMing, I think, the summer before I left for, or maybe after my freshman year. Um, but uh, I didn't start DMing regularly until after college. Uh, and in that time, I was mostly acting. Um, I, and then eventually I started moving toward producing and, and writing and more and more. And, and yeah, the, I mean, I think, I think a, there's a very good reason that a lot of showrunners are DMs and come out of kind of the D&D tradition. First of all, the books teach you how to tell stories. I mean, you look at something like the the DMG2 from fourth edition, and that is just such an incredible set of, of resources on telling stories, but also on um, how to manage a group of people, which is exactly what you're doing when you're working in TV. You're, you're wrangling different perspectives. You're trying to make everyone have their moment where they feel like they're uh, special. <laughs> you're trying yeah. to make sure that you're giving a consistent narrative, that it stays exciting, that you're introducing quality twists and, and turns, and all of that stuff is is laid out and you learn through d d It's the best it's the best acting class I've ever taken. It's the best writing class I've ever taken. It's the best producing class I've ever taken, you know, is just playing the game. The the tool set you gain is so so extraordinary. It's really beautiful and i think that's an excellent point too in that you are simultaneously engaging all these levels at the same time where you're learning just about how to work with a group of people to tell a story um i'm reminded a friend of mine who writes for uh, a, a late night show was telling me a great thing that an elder co-worker said that had been there for a long time when uh, this friend of mine was voicing some nerves about beginning the job and this sort of elder television writer was like hey half the job is being cool but meaning Half the job is, do you work well with people? Are This is a high stress job. Are you resilient and kind and compassionate to your other coworkers? Can you be empathetic to the needs of the other people around you? Like those soft skills are definitely so important in almost any creative endeavor you could follow in life. And the game teaches them to you so much because you're managing the feelings of all these other people. You're trying to satisfy the desires for a group of, you know, three to seven people that all love this story and they're all figuring out how to have it go in a satisfying direction all at once. Um, you're also and, learning what combinations of characters make for interesting story, what kind of conflicts will make for interesting story and obstacles. And, you know, there's there are so many sort of, there's that there are only seven stories idea out there, mm -hmm. um, but you really learn so many variants of them through through playing and, and reading the content and, you know, learning more about the the world and things like that. It, it's so it's so wonderful. Um, I love that so much. Um, uh, when you are um, DMing, because I love what you said too about that idea of like, you know, you're learning all these storytelling skills. Um, one thing that we get asked about a lot is, or that I get tweeted at a lot and people comment about a lot is always like, oh, you're being, you know, the bad guy to your players. Like, be kind to them, be nice to them. Um, uh, when you first started DMing, was there, uh, what are your thoughts on the degree of of like simultaneously that kind of like pat your head and rub your tummy at the same time of I am the antagonist and also I am deeply serving my players and want the best for them and collaborating with them. Yeah, I think, um, you know, story comes out of conflict. That's mm -hmm. that's what a story is. It's why you don't get the story about, you know, so-and-so woke up today and they brushed their teeth and they combed their hair and they went to their job and it was a regular day. And that's <laughs> the end of the story. That's, there's nothing there um, to to build on. There's nothing there for you to connect to emotionally. So I think that, that you really do. You, I tell my players when we start a campaign, if they are level one, they are basically burly farmers. Um, you're not, <laughs> I, I love the hero's journey. I, I, I don't want my level one players coming in and going, 
I am an expert. I can do all of the things. I'm going to succeed at no matter what I try. Because then where's the game? Where's the story? Where's the adventure that you're going on? What are you going to learn from it and come back with? So I, I tend to try and start from that sort of place um, and move forward from there. I also am a strong believer in session zeros. Um, mm -hmm. And part of my session zero is talking about things like lethality. Are you comfortable uh, with your character dying? If so, what are the circumstances under which you would feel okay with that? You know, do you want this world to be about the adventure of this particular character and their journey, or do you want this to be about this is a dangerous world? You know, do you want do you want to go grimdark? Do you want to? I, I I love talking to players and knowing that. Um, and then the really fun one is when players begin playing more and more, and they go. I'm actually okay if my character dies heroically. Like, if there's a moment where it makes more sense, I would rather that that happens. That's always such a delightful moment with, with yeah. players when they realize that the story is so much bigger than any character. Um, and I think one thing that streaming has kind of contributed to um, for new players is this fear that if your character dies, the game is over. And, and, you know, something you learn in the earlier editions when you have to have six or seven character sheets just to get past level one um, is that you can walk away from a character. It's okay to leave a character and bring in something new and come back to that character or get rid of that character completely and try something different. There, it, just because your character dies doesn't mean your story as a player is over. Um, yes. Um one of the uh, great things I think that I've seen in campaigns too that has helped take the sting off of death is having other ways for char player characters to exit other than death, which I've really enjoyed. Like having that thing where it being like, hey, if you're not having fun as this character, let's get you another character. This like you, we can change perspectives. This is not a vessel for you this is not your proxy in the world it's a character in the world that you happen to be piloting around and giving these actions to but fundamentally you could be someone else and that first time that you have like yeah this pc is go we, we i've been running one home game for uh over 11 years now and a character uh one character had a kid became a dad and stopped adventuring <laughs> he was like I'm going to go raise my child with my partner. I'm not doing these adventures anymore. Which is such a satisfying arc. Yes. You don't get to hear those stories. You want to hear about the person who, who realizes, oh, I have found something that is more important to me than the things that I thought were important to me. That's such growth. And, and that's such a beautiful thing to have in a story. Um, I, I also am a firm believer in letting people have happy family lives. Um, I think there's a, a really important point in that, that not every character has to be an edgelord whose parent, my parents were killed, and then my, my, my partner was killed. Like, there's nothing, it's fridging characters, and it's not finding a motivation from your <clears throat> more recent experiences, which I think are, are the best impetus for an adventurer, um, unless you have, like, I had a character who was like, I saw a play when I was a kid and there was this character in this play and I basically spent my life trying to become that. That was awesome. But if you're going into it as the only reason you aren't rooted anywhere is because you're taking kind of the easy, simple character excuse of, oh, my family's dead. You're missing out on so much. And But there is a degree of trust with a DM that you have to have that they're not gonna go, oh, you have a happy family life, mine. Um, <laughs> sure, of course. Which we uh, usually do, <laughs> but yeah. to, to their credit, I am going to try to do that. But <laughs> they have calculated that risk accurately. Um, uh, but I totally get what you're saying, and I think that y there is something very beautiful about having a family life or having something more rich than that. But I think part of that also that we can articulate for people is that when you are making those edgelord decisions, I so again, as, as I've said, I used to work at this uh, live action role playing summer camp. Whenever we would have the youngest boys come in, like these 11 year old boys, guarantee, we had a boy one time who came in uh, who said, my character is a rogue and an assassin. His name is Wolf. He was raised by wolves, but the wolves he was, he did, his parents were killed and he was raised by wolves. Those wolves were killed by other wolves, oh, and now no. Wolf, and now Wolf is on a revenge quest 
to kill the wolves that killed his adoptive wolf parents. And I was like, so so to be clear, wolves human parents nowhere in the mix because they died too early and he was like they were elves not humans and i was like roger that <laughs> gotcha gotcha and so but but i in in having seen that happen so many times it's very clear that what that phenomenon is about is which makes a lot of sense for kids i think is it is epic power fantasy and the fantasy is what if i didn't care about anything and didn't have anything that was close to me so i would never have to be vulnerable so literally my only interactions with the fantasy world are i am invulnerable because even if you kill me i don't care and uh and everything that i do it's just only gravy nothing is at risk it's like i have nothing to lose i'm attached to nothing i'm already emotionally you know mm -hmm. uh, detached and everything can just be power fantasy which makes yeah. a lot of and sense it's all, they're always chaotic neutral too it's, <laughs> and it's not it's not actual chaotic neutral it's chaotic jerk face yes um, <laughs> uh and yeah i think we all we all have our, our first characters are almost always proxies like I feel like the trajectory I see for people is like the first character is your proxy, the second character is you trying to be the antithesis of who you are, and then you finally start settling into actually playing characters who are novel and based on the dice. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think they, there's a lot. I think that's a, a reason that so many um, women play uh, elf casters first. Mm -hmm. um, and so many men play either paladins or or rogues, you know, mm -hmm. edge lords, um, right off the bat. Because I think there are these very specific kind of gendered notions of who we should be, and we're we're wanting to explore those things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that like, if you are watching this and you're going to be running a game for the first time, and someone brings that edge lord character out. I think when you, because the the sad part about those edgelord characters, listen, if you are a middle school boy, have at it. Those kids seemed to have a great time when we were LARPing as Wolf, searching for the wolves that killed his wolf parents to avenge their wolf deaths. Seem to have a ball. If you're an adult, I think sometimes that can kick in a little bit. It's when I, I used to uh, coach and teach improv, and in that same way, People don't say no in an improv scene because they're jerks. They say no in an improv scene because they're scared. Mm -hmm. And no is a way of reasserting power and dominance. It's just that it doesn't work. It's not going to give you the results you're thinking. In the same way, if someone is feeling a little trepidatious, they make an edgelord character, I think you can talk them through that and say, hey, I noticed you made a character that's like very antagonistic, very closed off to connections with other party members. I totally get why you would do that. It makes yeah. sense. And you're right. That is a, a very common badass that you've seen in movies and television. So why wouldn't it occur to you to make that character again? That being said, you are going to find that as the game progresses, you're going to start to become more and more uncomfortable with this character as you watch the party around you make these close connections and develop this badass camaraderie. Yeah, well, and that's a way to get around it, too, is is I also do in my session zeros, I do, you know, fiasco relationships. I Everyone is awesome. tied to one other person in, in the campaign because that way you're never going to leave <laughs> you're yeah. going to want to stay there for a reason because you have your sibling there or you have um a person who you was your fellow soldier in the war you know whatever it is you're going to have a reason it gives it gives the players a, a reason to stick around even when they instinctually might be like i'm, I'm out bye <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, you truly. guys, you guys fight. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit back here and, and hang until this is done, and I can come in and take all the treasure. Um, that I think having those, those relationships right off the bat really gives them someone to interact with. It gives them someone to build story with outside of game if they want to keep going on that. There's just there's so much value to to having connections happening. Um, I fully, fully agree. Um, and by the way, when you say fiasco relationships, um, uh, is, is that based off the game Fiasco? Or is yeah, that yeah, yeah. awesome? I've heard and about Fiasco. Yeah. Sly Flourish wrote a, wrote a chart for them as well that you can use specifically for D&D. For &D. But you can also make your own. Just the ideas are like coworker, partner, mm -hmm. um, 
you own a business together, they're your neighbor, you know, just any of those sort of things. Um, I love that. Um, speaking of resources like this, I wanted to talk about this incredible uh, resource that you created, uh, the Accessibility in Gaming resource. Um, this is a hugely helpful boon to the world uh, that this is out there. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, what prompted the creation of it and what it is and how people can find it and use it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the Accessibility resource is um, I do a lot of work in terms of accessibility and inclusion in tabletop gaming um, across the board, but but specifically, uh, my focus has often been on the disabled community. Um, I have something called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I'm an ambulatory wheelchair user, which means I, I embody the riddle of the Sphinx. I, I can be on two legs, uh, two in a cane, or on wheels. So it, it just depends on the day and how I'm I'm doing. Um, and, and so, uh, the disabled community has been hugely important in my life, but it is a community that has been historically excluded from fantasy worlds. Um, and players are often not uh, given the tools they need to be able to participate fully. So I wanted to find a way um, to point to the best resources about disability and inclusion that I found over, I don't even know how many years, um, and that I've been saving and, and um, compiling for my own use. but. It also gives a way for people to educate themselves and learn. So there's that 101 conversation. Um, it can get really exhausting to answer the same questions uh, about disability over and over. Um, and so this kind of gives me something I can I can show people and other other disabled people can can show people to say, hey, um, take a look at these resources. And once you've gone through that, we can come back and have a conversation if if it's not answered there. But it, it's a little bit of a shortcut. It, it was a little bit of a a selfish thing, I guess, because I wanted to have that. But I also wanted to be able to give people these resources that they may not have known existed. Um, and and it's it's been, it's ever expanding. Um, but there is a link, I believe, which will be posted with this to, yes. to the toolkit. Um, but it's a Google Doc, so it's screen reader friendly. Um, and it collects everything from resources about the basics of disability and how people interact with disability, the social model of disability, um, to talking about specific mechanics, links to um, information about how to make your websites more accessible, how to implement captioning on your on your stream. Um, just it, it, I made it as comprehensive as I could to get people included because I think there are amazing stories to be told and um, in a world that is constantly ravaged by monsters it seems to me that there would be more disability and more accessibility uh, rather than less and I, I think it's just a a place where as a society we don't give it enough attention uh, the disabled community is the largest minority in the world mm -hmm. um, it's one in four people um, and it's a community that isn't given um, a lot of voice in, in media, you know, in, in stories, and especially in fantasy. Um, and the way we, we conceive of fantasy really shapes our reality. So I, I strongly believe that you can make your fantasy better than our current reality, and that will help tilt the balance um, as we go on. Uh, that is uh, incredibly poignant um, and and a beautiful message for people that are watching this that have games of their own they want to run. I cannot encourage you highly enough to go check out this resource. Uh, it is a, <laughs> yeah, it's very funny uh, to hear you say like, oh, I made this as sort of a, uh, uh, you know, a tool to be like, check out the FAQ and then get back to me. It's an incredible boon and a gift to the world to have this, to be able to go and consult. Um, and as you've said, it does answer a tremendous amount of the questions, both about how to make your real world content more accessible and then the fantasy universes as well that people are playing within. Um, uh, within your sort of like play experience, um, uh, what are, and obviously people, I encourage everyone to go check out the toolkit first and foremost. Um, were there like things early on when you were playing D&D uh, uh, &D or other, in fact, any tabletop game where you were like, oh, this is an immediate fix that like, I wish more of the DMs I were playing with did this, or I wish more of the people that were, I was just at the table with were like doing this. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think breaks is a really simple one. And, it, you know, one of the things that I, I really strongly believe in is universal design, which is that mm -hmm. when you're being inclusive, you really are, um, it's affecting everyone. It's the same way that curb cuts help people who have strollers or, or are wheeling up uh, deliveries, things like that. Um, it's not just for people who use wheelchairs. Um, so I think one of the breaks are one of the easiest, most immediate things, and also have had a huge rate of return for me in terms of in terms of gaming. Um, for me, I try and do breaks every one and a half to two hours. Um, mm -hmm. That's about where my body and brain will get cranky and need need to move around or stand up. Um, but also, I found you know it, it's it's I also have ADD, so that's that's a really fantastic way to keep myself focused. Um, and I found that with, with many of my players, at about two hours, that's when attention really starts to wane. Um, and so by taking five minutes, standing up, going to the restroom, getting a snack, getting a drink, coming back, you know, having a chance for your brain to go do other things and check your phone and whatever you need to do, that's, that's a really simple one. Um, and on the topic of phones, you know, devices can be an accessibility tool at the table. Um, some people need to have their fidget stuff. And, as long, I think as long as it's not um, affecting the other players at the table, technology has become so much a part of the game now um, with, between D&D you know, Beyond and having books available uh, in, in ebook form, having your notes, all of that, um, those resources, and particularly now, obviously, we're existing through, <laughs> through technology um, with each other. But I, I think technology, for a long time, I, I was a zero tech table. I did not want, I wanted this to be our, our, our break from the world. And as I've experienced more and learned more about um, neurodiversity and all sorts of things, I've just realized that if a player says they need it at the table, in general, communication is key. If somebody says they need something, as, as much as possible, the answer should be yes. Uh, yeah, do what you need to do. Um, I also usually run an open table where people can get up if they need to and things like that. But um, yeah, the, the answer should be should always be yes to access. And if you can implement it, implement it in your session zero, you know, offer up, hey, if anyone has any access needs, let me know. You can let me know privately. You can let me. We can discuss it here. But we'll we'll make it work so you can enjoy the game as much as everyone else is enjoying the game. I think that's huge and i think we, we've said before on the podcast as well this idea that like one of the things i think people are always quick to do is look at a behavior and say what would that behavior mean if i was doing it that's what it really means mm -hmm. and it might be it, it might be true for you as an individual that if you were looking at your phone you've checked out and aren't paying attention it doesn't mean that that's true for the person doing it and it could be an accessibility tool for them um, you know, that's a lesson I learned many years ago. I was working again as a camp counselor, uh, working with a whole bunch of kids on the autism spectrum who there was a young boy. I remember it was, you know, jarring at first because I hadn't worked with kids before on the autism spectrum. And there was one kid who was, you know, walking in the back of the room, stimming, not making eye contact. And uh, that uh, kid's tutor was basically like, no, like he's paying incredibly close attention. And after the workshop, uh, uh, he uh, delightedly recited every piece of information that had been given. Awesome. And, and it, it was like, oh, yeah, you cannot substitute what is true for you for anybody else in the world. You have to communicate and check in because, you know, people are unique and people aren't going to have the same. It's not always going to mean the same thing. So I think like letting allowing phones or tablets to the table and again, like don't don't use those symptoms to mean the thing it's like oh if they're checking their phone that means they've checked stimming out it can mean you're really excited and you're having yeah. a great time like that that's often when people will stim is when they're when they're really engaged and really excited um, yes but also i, I want to point out you know disability is non-binary people think that disability is if you are blind you see zero like it's there's nothing there 90 percent of blind people have some vision um mm -hmm. Many, many wheelchair users are ambulatory like me, where you might see us walking one day and you might see us in a chair the next. It doesn't mean anybody's faking. Um, and are some people's uh, symptoms vary day to day and they're, what, they're, what they're able to do that day varies day to day or hour to hour. So, you know, checking in with people, seeing if they're okay, um, finding out what people need. Sometimes people will just wanna lie on the couch and participate by being present. Um, yeah. but not necessarily able to sit up at the table that day. 
all of those things, it, it's all just listening to the people you're working with and asking questions if they're comfortable answering them. I, yes, a hundred percent. And I love what you said too about like, making these things more accessible helps everybody. The, regardless of your ability status, everybody could benefit from a break after two hours. <laughs> everybody benefits. Um, uh, I get roasted a lot in the comments of our shows because I snack constantly because my blood sugar shoots up and down. And if I'm not constantly eating almonds, I get cranky and distracted. Um, so yeah, well, and things like captioning, people can, you know, watch a stream with the sound off which is something a lot of people didn't realize that they wanted and then all of a sudden something they love will start getting captioned and there's a huge difference and I also I do I want to commend you because um this is the first show where I said hey is it captioned and the answer was yep like it was already <laughs> taken care of and that's so incredibly rare um I'm usually providing resources to get things captioned and t t it made it such a comfortable there's a degree of comfort when someone is acknowledging accessibility um, and 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 things like pronouns or or whatever whatever it is to 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 respect the identity of people. Um, mm -hmm. It's so meaningful because you come in knowing that you are welcome, which is not necessarily how it goes most of the time. I uh, deeply appreciate that. We you know we we try. We don't always get it right, and we're always looking to improve and learn more in everything, not only Dimension 20, but everything Dropout does, we're always trying to do better, but that means a lot. I, I really appreciate that. It means um, a lot to, 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 to me and other people who use captioning as well, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, shucks, that's lovely. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to talk as well, so again, to everybody, go check out the toolkit, go check out this resource. I have read it myself and it's so awesome and it will it will light your mind up as you read it in terms of not only how to make your table more accessible to the real life people that are playing there but also in terms of world design and in terms of how the like like disability will exist in one form or another in your fantasy world and you have a responsibility i think to portray it ethically and also like in the same way that so much of fantasy is talking about things in the real world, um, uh, hopefully there will be inspiration there to make a more inclusive and wonderful fantasy world that allows people to see themselves reflected in it uh, and tell new and exciting and thrilling stories with these characters. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, real quick uh, also talk a little bit about so you've been playing D&D &D, uh, and how you got involved uh, with uh, actual play and especially like Alindra on Silver and Steel uh, uh, after after having the game be such a big part of your life. Uh, what was it like to get involved in actual play? It was delightful. Um, you know, it's this hybrid of all of the things I love to do um, in so many ways. So it's getting to connect with people. It's getting to tell stories collaboratively. It's getting to do some performance stuff and play characters and um, tell long form stories and tell short form stories. Uh, it, it just was really delightful. I got involved um, because of, of Satine Phoenix. Um, Satine and I had been friends for about eight years at that point, maybe. We met at Comic-Con, my first, my first Comic-Con. Uh, we met because she was in a booth next to some of my friends. We started talking and became friends. Um, and one day she called me and said, hey, I know you play in DM. Would you want to come talk about it on, on stream? And I kind of went, OK. And then I ended up being on a show with her. And it just sort of went from there. Um, and part of that, too, was representation because I started getting um, especially young women reaching out to me and saying I've I've never seen a, a women who DM before because when I started doing that then talking about it publicly um, people there weren't a lot of women involved in the community openly and that's you know phenomenally that's changed uh, in the last few years but I did feel that there was this once that once I had people coming to me and saying I started playing because of you. I'm now six months into DMing the campaign, and it's this, that, and the other thing. That really, um, that really resonated for me, and I went, okay, well, I need to be doing this. And and I wasn't uh, super public about my health stuff at that point. And then I realized there was no one who was at that point disabled and talking about it. Um, and and I felt like 
you know, I think people deserve to see themselves embraced in in these worlds and and having the opportunity to have the amazing experiences that I've had playing. Um, so that that sort of is the genesis of it. And then when uh, when D and D Beyond kind of reached out to me and said, "Hey, do you want to want to do this?" I was I was overjoyed. So Alindra's genesis. The thing that's really special to me about Alindra is. Um, she has a whole bunch of names. She has a really, really long string of names. Um, <laughs> but each of those names was given to me by someone who's been very important to me in my life or my gaming life. So my mother gave me Alindra. Um, Garana Hill is the Elvish translation of the street I grew up on, like the street I was born on. Um, Griff is named for my best friend's grandparent. Um, uh, Grant is named for, for my friend Grant Imahara, who passed away this year. So when I got my dragon, that was, uh, it, I, I couldn't land on a name for a really long time. And finally, I realized that that was, that was the name. Um, you know, just, just people who have been incredibly influential. Um, Ryan Black helped me with Rhyme Spiro. Like, it, it all comes, so when I played her, immediately I was already going in, because I joined the, the cast later than, than, mm -hmm. uh, the initial group I came in two episodes in when Todd took over to DM and um, I already felt really strongly about this character she meant a lot to me already so I wanted to go in and and do her justice you know and and, and she developed into this amazing you know this incredible person who I've been getting to play for you know a couple of years now and it's it's a joy every time I get to play her it's it's so much fun and I love those people too they, they just the stories we get to tell together, it really is, it's one of the highlights of my week. I love it so much. It's so beautiful. It's very moving to hear you talk. I, 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 words words always tend to fail when you're talking about characters that mean this much to you, but it's so, it, it's such a funny thing because it's, it's uh, it is so deeply heartfelt and significant and you are honoring so much of your own life and journey. You know, it's it's not a stretch. You look at things like the never ending story where it's like, no, like this, like, yes, it's magic and it's fantasy and it's symbols, but they're the symbols I use to talk about my real life. Because yes. if I talk about my real life in, in the logistical mundane details, I feel like it will lose some sauce in the translation. You won't really get it because it doesn't feel like the, the, the logistics. It feels like dragons. My life, yes. you know, like it feels like dragons. And, and that's what something like Buffy does so well is it, it turns monsters into metaphor or, you know, a lot a lot of the, the supernatural type um, shows that's that that is what the stories are about and i think that's that's what's so interesting is you know the monsters can absolutely be metaphors for mm. what you are dealing with or trying to that, and that's what's fun about storytelling is you find the things that that matter and then you you tug on those strings until you yes. have a problem uh truly i it's you know there is uh uh the the fun of the storytelling is that you fall in love with these you can't help but fall in love with them and um it makes all it's it's so funny to talk about uh, i've said this before on the podcast i think but the thing that games always need is something along the line of stakes right you need either you're you're winning bragging rights or you're playing poker and you're going to win real money and with dungeons and dragons the, the the conceit of the game and with uh, with tabletop in general is always this thing of the stakes are you love these people and it don't it don't matter that they're fictional if anything happens to them you're going to feel real sad and it 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 makes you lean into those dice rolls and the idea of like i need to hit a 20 right now oh god please let me hit that 20 right now um it, it is intoxicating and it uh that love for those characters is uh so meaningful and i hope that people um i think that's why you see people have a fascination um with these games is because it taps into that thing that's so primal and deep. Yeah. Um, you know, the, I had a character who, the, the first character I ever had die, I got really upset um, mm -hmm. when it happened and I got chastised for it. I was told, how, how dare you care about it this much? It's just a game and you know, you're doing the, the mazes and monsters thing. Like you're, you're 
putting too much into it. And the, the great irony of that is now that's what people are striving for in their games is to pull those kinds of emotions out of their players and to, to have a table that cares that much, that it matters so much. You know, you look at something like Adventure Zone where it, it was, you just follow people through the course of their lives as it's all happening in concurrence with, with the story. Um, yeah. and, and see how those things influence it. And, you know, that's something that's so amazing about long campaigns. Um, but getting people invested, having people put their heart into something, um, it, it just, it's always, I, I'm kind of amused by the irony now that, that people were, you know, uh, kind of jerks about the fact that I cared, <laughs> that this, this game meant, meant so much to me. Um, and, and you know, now that's that's really what everybody's fighting for and pushing for in their stories. Yeah, um, we won. The good guys won that battle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Cheers true. to that. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, it's really true. And I think that I remember that too. I, I learned to play as a 10 year old kid and I was being taught by a group of 20 year olds. I made this bard. I made a bar. There, my mom put up a notice in our local gaming store about like, my child wishes to learn to play. And a group of, again, admittedly very generous to teach, to be like, yeah, we'll teach this 10 year old kid how to play. Um, but I made this bar. Uh, they, this, this one DM at the table was a real jerk and killed my character. I got turned to stone by a Gorgon uh, and then smashed. Um, so mean. So mean. And they kept telling me, like, like you, like you, they were like, you shouldn't be a bard. You will not be a very good bard. And I was like, but I want to make up songs about the things we do. Um, and so it was this very, like, in any case, point being, there that was an attitude there. But I think that, that it's one of those things where um, that older kind of malevolent vibe to the game i think the game was all this is maybe overly romantic the game was destined to escape from those people because it's it's one of those things where it's like when you realize the power that something like this has and you go like if you want to play a war game there's really great war games out there don't you see that this has the capacity to tell stories that are so deeply impactful? I think I think the writing was on the wall the moment the game kind of went like, this is a story about heroes. And, yeah. the, and that it was like, no, no, <laughs> some musical theater kids are gonna find this, some LARPing kids are gonna find this, and it is going to take off because that is what the game can do that nothing else can do. Yes. Um, uh, so how do you feel about the kind of video game players that come in with this idea of, of I'm going to win d and I'm going to come in and I'm going to be, I'm going to go after all of the loot and I'm going to go after XP and just that's, that's my trajectory is I'm going to, I'm going to find all the synergies and it's a totally valid way to play. Sure. But I think for, for those of us who have, have played through older editions, sometimes there's a different sense. So what, what do you... What are your feelings on it? So caveat, I am a hugely crunchy player in addition to loving improv and storytelling. Like there is no part of the game I don't, when people are like, do you want to do it? Do you, do you like crunchy mechanic stuff or do you like storytelling stuff? I go, yes, I like yeah. all of it. Um, I want, I want a character that is just optimized to hell and back and for them to be a character who, you know, so I love it all weirdly my risk and again if you are playing the game and having fun you are doing it correctly if 100%. you it's the only way to win dnd it's the only way to win dnd is to have fun so if if you are like i don't like talking in character i don't like role playing i want to hit the dungeon grab the loot and bail and you and your friends are doing that and having a great time salud slancha go with god have a great yeah. time right um uh that being said the thing i would always say if i were to to raise a counterpoint to that is, cool, you like the crunch, you like the mechanics, you like the optimizing. Let's take one step back. What is this game optimized for? If you wanna optimize, let's optimize. Because there are more mechanically advantageous systems to do pure video game style play. Namely, video games. 
Um, <laughs> you could play something. If you're just down to grind and grab loot, my feeling is this game's parameters are always so loose. Like the judgment calls inherent in this, like they're like, like if you are the kind of player who's like, buy the books, I don't like any messing around. I don't like loose edges. You don't like loose edges. The DM is setting difficulties based on gut feeling, and that's in the rule book. Like, the game is rife with judgment calls and bizarre parameters of how to adjudicate things. And by the way, the person who's running your antagonists could at any time drop a terrorist on your party and kill everybody, and the only thing preventing them from doing that is the fact that it's a creative writing exercise and that that would be lame. <laughs> so that weirdly my answer to the optimizers is optimized the game is not optimized for crunch even though admittedly compared to other tabletop games D, &D does have a bunch more crunch to it but even within that i don't think even at the farthest edges of tabletop you're always going to be coming back to this central thing of why are we at a table virtual or otherwise telling a story together unless this thing is supposed to be rooted in a collaborative storytelling exercise right yeah I agree completely. And also there's that great moment when you get someone who has only played video games when they're newer to role play, where they realize that they think there are these walls there and then suddenly they push through and they're like, oh, I, I didn't mean to. <laughs> oh, what's over here? Oh, oh, you mean that failed roll means that something really, really interesting is gonna happen? I'm gonna, can I just, I wanna just, my, can I? <laughs> Okay. And then they go, they go full tilt. And it's, it's one of the greatest moments, I think, for me when I'm playing with new players is the moment that light bulb goes off. Oh, and they, like, they had that recognition that there are no walls here. Yes. Oh, God. That is actually a perfect segue into us beginning uh, to get some fans. These are submitted on our Discord. Thanks, everybody, for submitting these questions. We got some great questions coming here. That This leads us to an incredible one from Callum. Thanks, Callum. Um, okay. Uh, in 5e, critical successes slash failures for skill checks are a very common variant rule. Lots of people, particularly online, have very strong opinions about this rule. Uh, what are your thoughts on the pros and cons of critical successes and failures? Uh, the 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 ever the ever looming nat one and nat twenty, uh, Jennifer. What are, what are your thoughts on the critical success or failure? I I go back and forth sometimes. Um, I I like I like the variability of rolls, so I tend to do success based on how well you rolled. Um, I also think that there is this a lot of people come in thinking that a crit on either end is you can do whatever you want. I call it the, the moon jump. It's, it's people say, I can jump and I can jump to the moon because I rolled a 20. And you're like, mm, no. no <laughs> you, you can jump really high and you land very skillfully, but you're not going to be able to get to the moon. So I tend to play with with crits uh, in skill checks. Mm -hmm. um, but there are times when I won't apply them. It'll, you know, under certain circumstances, they have to be reasonable. And I do ap apply the, the spectrum of roles as well. If you get an 18, it's going to be a lot easier to do than it is if you get a three. Um, yeah. So that, that tends to be how I homebrew. How about you? I feel, I think that this question gets answered. I think you, uh, Callum, uh, you may have answered your own question here because I think the pervasiveness of this as a house rule tells you people like it they can't get away from it like i know that some people have very strong feelings against it but the issue here is is this you can have a very strong philosophical argument about why there shouldn't be critical successes or failures on skill checks when you're at the head of the fucking table and your player hits that nat 20 and they look up at you with that look of wonder in their eyes and they're like oh are you going to tell them they didn't succeed? Are you going to look at them in the eye and tell them for real, like, well, yes, you may have hit a 20 on the dice, but actually the the, def the difficulty class of it, no, you're not. Because, you, because you're going to, you, you will feel the sourness in the air as you rob them of that most noble role. At least that's how I feel. And 
I think that there is something very joyful about this idea that in real life, there there isn't this 5% chance that you will succeed on the impossible or a 5% chance that you will fail something that you should always be able to do. That being said, we're not in real life, we're in a story. And the idea of something going terribly wrong that should have been okay, or the idea of something impossibly succeeding at a moment where it absolutely had to, is like the bread and butter of storytelling. Um, uh, I think, you know, we obviously, you know, the game affords it during attack rolls, obviously. I think that there's some fun with doing it in saving throws as well, where it's like, oh, impossibly, you hit a nat 20 saving throw. Uh, and I think that it's also that fun thing of, it doesn't have to be that you accomplish anything, but you put a little bit more mustard on it, right? Like, it's a little bit better than than what just the numerical result of the roll would have been. Um, I think they're just too fun to ignore. And they let you do fun stuff, too. We uh, So I, I do homebrew that they are always crit fails and crit successes on that ones and that 20s. With this caveat that a lot of times I will just ignore a nat one because sometimes it'll be like, sometimes a nat one is like, okay, someone's like doing a research check and they get a nat one and it's like, what, do you burn the library down? Like, how do I really have, so sometimes you just, you hand wave it. And I think DMs should be okay with those hand waves. Um, so there is something really fun about having them think that they're all on the right track and giving them information that's completely wrong. So yeah, have I, have I heard of this bard? Oh yeah, they um. <laughs> you heard that they were a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like oh, I got I got the exact right intel, and they're well, yeah, exactly. They're walking around with something completely uh, incorrect, and I think too that you we had one. Uh, we have a character in this long running home game who is an 18th level wizard now, and at earlier levels he was in this high stakes wizard game of poker, um, and ended up losing they were and they were like gambling with things like memories and spells and all kinds of bizarre fey currency um and he unfortunately the wizard put his luck on the line lost it and lost it to to this like legendary wizard who was like in the realm of death so he has been luckless forever which by the way doesn't mean that he's unlucky it means that he is without luck and so he is the only person mechanically in the world that doesn't auto fail on a one or auto succeed on a 20. Oh, that's um, so cool. It's, it's very fun. He's so- I'm, I'm, I'm doing some Wild stuff coming up. I, I, may, I may just yank that. <laughs> please yoink away. It's very, because it's fun, because it means that there's this sort of grim resoluteness. And now that, now that uh, he, at lower levels, it ended up like saving his ass a couple times. And now at higher levels, it's kind of an interesting thing because it it means that like more often than not a nat 20, he already would have succeeded on because he's so high level. But now it just means this thing of like, uh, if he's pursuing somebody, it's like, well, maybe he'll make a mistake. And it's like, no, no, he doesn't have any luck. He won't make a mistake. Like yeah. nothing will, will ha you might get lucky, but nothing about him will result in a bizarre error. Well, and then like you start thinking about how would the, the gods of luck feel about that, about someone being pulled from their domain and then you can, Timora is going to get cranky and, <laughs> you know. <laughs> exactly. It's very, very fun. Uh, and another character, the, the campaign sorcerer is specifically like an entropomancy luck and destiny sorcerer. Oh my gosh. So you have this this one, this young kid who is all luck and good. Every one of their spells is flavored. They have like protect, their protection from projectiles isn't like a magical rune shield. It's just, no one ever seems to hit me or my friends. <laughs> like. Um, and then this wizard who's this dour old man who's like, I don't have any luck at all. It's all skill, baby. Um, uh, but I think that you, you know, make the right call for your table. I think it's just too fun to get away from. Um, it feels like it should exist. Um, you want the highest highs and the lowest lows. And, and that's where, that's where the story comes from. Uh, great things come out of failure too. Exactly. A hundred percent. Um, this next question comes to us from um, Sinister Sea Slug. Thanks, Sinister Sea Slug. Uh, what is Sinister? Awesome name. <laughs> awesome name. We awesome love it. Name. Um, 
what are your favorite ways to introduce horror into story and plot? This is a great question. What are your favorite ways to introduce? And uh, uh, Jennifer and I were talking specifically about horror role playing like 10 candles before we got on. Jennifer, what what do you think the role of horror is? I guess specifically in D&D, but then more broadly in tabletop as well. I love horror. I am I'm a huge horror fanatic. Um, it, it's it's I wrote my thesis on zombies. Like this is I love it. Um, it's really hard to do well in tabletop um, because the things that you can add in tabletop are going to be dread. Um, mm-hmm. You can do that with narration and description. You can do that with mechanics, um, depending on what you're trying to get to. But um, I really recommend that everybody go pick up the 3.5 uh, Heroes of Horror book. Ooh, yes. That just teaches you everything about horror. But I also strongly recommend that you play stuff like Ten Candles. First of all, it'll change the way you DM forever because it's magic. Um, But also because it shows you how to amp up, how how you can amplify and intensify horror. Um, I think the best way to start is just have things be just slightly unsettling. Someone, someone stares a little bit too long, and or as they turn away, you think you 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 catch a nictating membrane over their eyes, but you're not sure. They're like, it may be the light playing tricks on you, um, and, and building that. But also, when you're doing horror, it's so important to talk to your players about what's okay. Um, that's a place where you can really get into stuff that squicks people out, not in a fun way. Mm-hmm. Um, so before you start implementing those things, I, I always really highly recommend talking to your players about things that you know phobias they might have or things like that because at the point it stops being fun that's when you've failed as a dm you're you're not doing the game right um or as a player if you're if you're doing that as a player and intentionally going against what is fun for people um but yes slow build starting really small um and then ramping it up you're not going to usually be able to get jump scares off that doesn't work super well yeah. but building the dread building the chase not letting them see the thing that they're up against what people will put into their imagination is always going to be worse if you just say that you see just a mass of you know teeth and eyes and this thing and just give a loose assemblage of what they look like it's so much scarier than if you showed them a picture um yes well i think that's that sort of it is you know to a certain degree, I agree with like the common wisdom that all fear stems from fear of the unknown, right? So you're always going to, the more clarity you add, clarity is almost a recipe for courage. It's a re, like, the more clarity you have, the more you're like, okay, like for example, I think one of the problems with televising or, 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 or depicting Lovecraftian stuff and like Eldritch horror is that when you look at it, as a three-dimensional computer represented figure, you're like, oh, that's just a big dog with too many eyes. You're like, that's kind of ridiculous. Yeah, it's like, that's that's a monster. I know what to do with monsters. You kill monsters. As opposed to, like, at the table, I think one of the benefits of tabletop is that you can be loose in your description. Um, uh, And again, it's weird stuff like saying, you look into the dark and all you can see. If you go like, um, uh, you look into the dark and you see a creature about eight feet in length with uh, 140 eyes. That is goofy as hell. If you go, you look out, eyes. All you see are eyes. What that does to a person's head is it makes them go like, all I see are eyes? How many? And then you like you have them yeah. on the back foot. Uh, There's an amazing um, podcast called The Magnus Archives. That yes. is a, yeah, and what they do with narration, if you're looking for ways to learn how to narrate horror, they are brilliant at it. Especially in, I think, episode four, they describe something that is so deeply unsettling, but not at all graphic. It's just, it's so weird that it actually had me looking around my apartment at night going, eh. <laughs> um, because it, it is this unknown, but just enough that you're like, oh, oh no, oh no. <laughs> Nope, yeah. nope, nope. <laughs> well, and I think that's something too is to remember that one of the one of the pro- the problems D and D is always going to run into when you're trying to do horror Nerds and dragons is that even at first level characters have abilities that are impossibly heroic, right? And 
the antithesis to horror is again clarity and one of the most the biggest pieces of clarity a character can have is knowing what to do uh it doesn't matter if i'm fighting if i have a magic sword even if you put me up against cthulhu part of me is going to go like okay odds are i die i'm gonna try to hit the big squid monster with the magic sword and you know what maybe we don't get lucky but what the hell Horror, I think, thrives in moments where you describe something that leaves your players going, well, I don't know what to do about that. You know, some weird thing where it's like um, you hear a tremulous wailing off in the mist. Something screams and is gone. You can't be sure if it was human. It doesn't sound like it was calling out for help. It just seemed like it was calling out in confusion and misery. And they go, well, I don't know. <laughs> I, and if you were left with that feeling of, is that bad? Is that good? I think horror tends to thrive in those moments uh, of uncertainty. Um, uh, but I would say too, um, uh, that especially like introducing horror into a plot, like you said, like specifically the question was how you do it into the plot or story. Um, just remember that like, there's a big difference between horror elements. Like if you go to, if you run Curse of Strahd, if you go somewhere that has like gothic horror elements, your players might not be scared because again, to a group of high level adventurers, the difference between, you know, a werewolf or a vampire and some other kind of monster, like an Ankeg or some other, you know, some elemental, there's not that much of a difference. So, so horror, at, at a certain point just becomes a flavor unless you're taking pains to introduce those elements of uncertainty and dread like you're talking about. Um, uh, love that question. Thanks, Sinister Sea really Slug. Um, uh, this next thing is explore as much horror as you can. You know, look into uh, how people write it, how people read it, um, what's done in movies, what can you pull from that? Um, and actually, if you can go, if you can find a movie on Netflix or something with audio description, it's really interesting to hear how they do horror with that. Yes. There's really um, cool description stuff. Um, and I also love to what Jennifer was saying about like making sure you're checking in with your table whenever you do stuff like horror. I think there's that one of these things that we can generally assume is like the assumption at a table of friends that have come together to play a game is normally fun. That's like the baseline. Like we have come here to have fun. However, I think all of us know that like a lot of people go and watch horror movies. Horror movies are fun, but they're not fun. And it's the, the same can be said for lots of genres. Like if you're going and watching a wonderful romance story, that is deeply gratifying on a level, but you're not in your chair going, woo! <laughs> you're not there. It's not like a roller coaster. It's not one of those things that's like, oh, this is fun. Yeah. That's okay. A group of adults can come together to seek an emotional experience that provides catharsis. That could be fear. That could be sorrow. That could be romance. That could be lots of different things. Uh, and it's just, again, about communication at the table and coming to an agreement of like, hey, in addition to like hanging out and seeing each other at this tabletop and playing a game together, are we looking to get another ancillary experience? Is that horror? Is that one of any other number of emotions here? And all of that that's groovy as long as there's consent, communication, and agreement at the table. Yeah, and what function is it serving in the story too, I think is also an important question because horror, of, of all genres, horror may be the most metaphorical. Um, it's mm -hmm. always a way to uh, almost metastasize anxieties in the world. Um, yes. And so that can be really interesting when you're doing that for characters, um, but it can be less fun sometimes when you're doing it for people. So like doing an outbreak scenario right now would probably not be the best thing because that's not letting people have the fun of the escapism at the table. It, it's forcing people to confront things, which on the other hand, some people might be like, yes, I want to be able to defeat this. I want to feel like I have control over the world. Um, so it's very much knowing your table and talking to your players, but it, it can be a great way to explore characters' fears too. Though. Yes, absolutely. I, I totally, totally agree. Um, speaking of which, this next question um, uh, uh, comes to us from Emma. Um, thanks, Emma. Uh, Emma asks, uh, how do you deal with triggers that come up at the table? Uh, assuming something was forgotten about slash uh, not discussed beforehand slash the person being triggered didn't mention it, how do you deal with the triggering situation if it arises? Um, 
this is an excellent question, I think. Um, and it, it goes to something that's very good too, because I think on the podcast before we've talked about session zeros, safety tools like lines and veils, safety tools like the X card, those are great. But one of the things I think is really important to hammer home is you absolutely can and should do your due diligence in setting up those boundaries. But one of the things you don't want to do is assume, well, I did our session zero, I did the X card, I did the lines and veils, there will ne <laughs> Exactly, for, for a million reasons. Uh, if, uh, up to and including triggers can arise. People can go through events during a long running game where they develop new triggers. People can discover a trigger at the table that they didn't know they had and so therefore couldn't have thought to raise during your session zero. Um, uh, Jennifer, uh, what are your thoughts and feelings about like the best tools and practices for people to deal with that as it arises organically in the moment? Yeah, so um, in the resource document, I do have a link to safety tools. I have a link to uh, the tabletop safety toolkit that was made um, that's brilliant. Also, the Monty Cook Consent and Gaming Toolkit is great. Um, but yeah, uh, it has to be an ongoing thing. So you have to, the, one of the first things I say at my table is you can joke about almost anything, but when we're talking about safety tools, I take it 100% seriously. If you are making fun of safety tools, if you are giving anyone any shit for, for using them, you're out of the game, period. Like this is this is no, no questions asked. Um, the idea of, of undermining uh, someone's fun and, and feeling comfortable at a table is, is not okay. Um, so I think you can work with, you know, you can work with LARP tools, you can do hand signals, you can have a way for people to privately message you, um, have an X card or use red, green, yellow. Um, and I think there's something too to having that intermediate um, step, which is I'm, we're edging towards something that I'm not cool with, I'm still okay, or this is still in character and I'm having fun being distressed, but also you need to, be aware of what's happening. Uh, there's a lot of checking in that needs to happen. And I mean, it all comes back to communication. Um, and some people aren't aren't great at picking up, you know, subtle signals. So having an agreed upon tool set at the beginning of the game that you remind people on an ongoing basis that it's okay to use um, is really important. And one thing as a DM you can do is you can actually use that tool set and show them that it's okay and that how it will go if you want to have a shift in the game. like. I have I have done that intentionally just said nope we're gonna X card this and we're gonna move away on my on my own story just to, to demonstrate that it's okay and we move right away to something else um, I do think that uh, there's a technique called the Luxton technique which is in the, in the toolkit that I think is the best uh, tool set for a long-running game where you really are with people you trust which allows people to um, narrate how they want that to go down mm -hmm. um, if they want to move away from it completely or if they they need to feel like they can win that situation or you know those are things that I think are can be really valuable but um, asking people or even having an anonymous survey online to say hey where are your what are your your no-goes um, and I keep that as a list on my DM screen so I can keep uh, just cross-referencing to make sure I'm not edging into that territory. Um, if I know we're going to play a particularly traumatic type of session, and I, I have things I just don't put in my game, period, because I, I, they've been common enough for people that I don't want them. I just automatically say nope. Um, but if I know that we're going to be facing off with something that's really intense or that could get intense quickly I, I try and check in with people before the game and say hey we're going to go into some stuff that's a little heavier tonight just i just want to make sure that's okay with everybody everybody feeling good about that or is there anything you want to add to the list of things you don't want to do but making sure people feel safe that they can trust that the table is going to respect their boundaries um and that they can uh, feel comfortable communicating those things i think is is a really important tool set uh, I fully, fully agree. And again, these resources are a great, great place for people to go and see, A, like what the different types of concerns that can be raised at your table are. And I would say too, to, to this question in particular, which I love, it, it is that thing about like, you know, assuming something was forgotten about, not discussed beforehand, the person trigger, you know, 
the what the question is sort of hinting at is this idea about like what do you do when the bumpers come off when the safeguards fail and i think what's important about that is nothing can replace like nothing can replace a genuine desire on behalf of everyone involved to keep each other safe and in fact if you if i had to choose between a table of people that uh, uh, you know, a table of people who were learning about these safety tools for the first time, but had my best interest in heart, and a table of true villains, but that had played with the safety mechanics and were like, yes, I am bound by the letter of the law in these cases. I'm going first table every time. Like, the genuine desire to take care of each other is something that I think is behind these guidelines. These guidelines are, as we have said, tools that hopefully are manifested from a genuine desire for everyone to have the best time possible and to take care of each other. Um, and to that end, should a safeguard fail, it's like, oh, this didn't come up in our lines and veils talk. This didn't come up in this other thing. I think that what the best thing you can do is say, what do we do? Like, how do we prepare for when the preparations fail? Which is always a funny conversation to have. But I think the way you prepare for that is go, well, we're doing it right now. We're having the talk, we're having the conversation. And I think that that needs to always be able to exist at the table. And there has to be kind of a, like, I don't know, there's, a, I just was talking this other day, there's a great line from Mr. Smith goes to Washington when, <laughs> When he goes like, I wouldn't give two cents for all your fancy rules if behind them there wasn't a little bit of everyday kindness and looking out for the other fella. To a, to a degree, these rules are tool sets that are hopefully in the hands of people who care about each other. And that that is motivating what you're doing so that you will never feel self-conscious for saying, hey, I forgot to say this in the rules section. And we go like, right, the, the rules talk was about taking care of each other. You are always allowed to reinitiate the rules talk so that we can more effectively take care of each other. The spirit of the law is what we're really focusing on. Yeah, it's an ongoing consent. And yes. I think also on that level, it's important to kind of think about, I mean, where, where these came from was from stuff that can get really unsafe. Like this came from, from outside of table talk. Um, mm. And... I think looking at kind of the structures that are included um, in those conversations, like taking time afterward to make sure people are okay and just checking in and, and making sure that you are um, minimizing the harm that came from a failure of tools to, mm. to like, if something goes wrong, if something goes really wrong, stop immediately, stop immediately, go take some time off. If that person needs to go be by themselves, that's fine. If they want to be, have a conversation about it, that's fine. But when, when it goes wrong, you have to acknowledge that something went wrong so that it doesn't happen again. Um, and, and that you are showing the person who felt like the tools have failed um, that you understand what didn't work. Because mm -hmm. if you don't understand what went wrong, you can't understand how to make it right. Um, so I think that's part of it too, is like really, if they fail, you have to acknowledge that they fail and really recommit to not letting that ever happen again. Yes. Um, to the best of your ability. A hundred percent. I fully, fully agree with that. Um, uh, this next uh, this next question comes to us from Michael. Thanks, Michael. Um, uh, I know you're familiar with throwaway NPCs becoming beloved by the players and growing into someone much more important than you had initially planned. But what about the opposite? Have you ever had problems where you create an NPC for a character's backstory who is supposed to be important with them, but the NPC and PC just don't click? Normally, if an NPC doesn't grab the characters, I just let them fade into the background. Uh, but this feels weird when it's someone who is supposed to be important to the PC. Um, how do you develop NPCs who are planned as a part of the character's background. Uh, what a great question, Michael. I've actually never seen a question like this before. Uh, the opposite phenomenon is very well documented of the Sam Smorkle goblin, who's a random NPC who just becomes a party mascot and is beloved. Um, uh, but yes, of, of an NPC that is supposed to be important. I committed this faux pas very, very badly in my, my long running home game of, a love interest for one of the characters who was this 
extremely like brooding uh, uh like like noble kind of like werewolf she it was almost like she was a selkie where she was like the one of the pcs was a hobbit and this other character had been from this like this like group of uh, wolves that were intelligent and speaking beasts who had been turned to a hobbit. So there's kind of like selkie, like mythos back and forth. Uh, but she was so, very. So you're saying she was an edge lord? She was an edge lord, exactly. She was very <laughs> brooding and mysterious. Uh, and all the other five PCs were like, "Your girlfriend sucks, dude. She's no fun to be around." Boo! Um, and it has now been. Anytime this character gets introduced, uh, the characters are like, "Oh, I roll. Like, what's this person's deal?" It's like I was the last of my wolf kin, and they're like, "Everyone's got a sad story, lady. I was trapped in a gem for a hundred years. We've all been there, <laughs> you know." Like, like. Um, uh, but uh, it's very much a funny thing where it's like, "Oh, I was going for this other thing," but then the characters didn't kind of click or whatever else. Um, uh, any any have that ever happened to you, Jennifer? Of like, oh, oh like, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I think I think anytime you run campaigns, you're gonna find things that worked and things that didn't work, and things you really thought were gonna work that failed, and then things that come out of nowhere and become huge successes. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with letting that character fade into the background. Um, if the players, if the character is supposed to, if the PC is supposed to care so much about this, if this person is so important in their backstory, then the PC should be doing some of the legwork on that. Yeah. Um, they should be finding the reasons why they care about this person or why they're important um, and if they continue to be important in their life or not. You also can do the ye old doppelganger. Like, the fact that it's not clicking is because this isn't actually the person. Uh, this is the bad version. And then you can throw that out and the players will never know um, that that was originally supposed to be who it was and it just didn't work. So you can you can do a... a, a a good old fashioned switcheroo um, if you need to, but don't abuse that because then you, your players don't trust anyone. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think there are, there are ways to replace the function of that character too. Um, yeah. You can always throw in, oh yeah, well they, it wasn't really, it wasn't really the, the wizard who was teaching me. It was the assistant who was the one who really helped me understand what was going on. Like if those, if those things are instrumental in your campaign, if not, let them go. They can fade into the background because you'll find some random NPC, you know, who's tap dancing on the side of the street that the, the, the players will be like, oh, they are everything. Yes. And they can, they can be your exposition bot instead. A hundred percent. And I think also your job as a dungeon master is not for your PCs to all be lovable and get adopted by the party. Your job is to represent a textured world that allows your players to go on adventures. Um, and if not every NPC is their absolute favorite of all time, that, that probably makes sense. You're not out here trying to churn out like fodder for like plushy dolls. Like everything has to be lovable or I have failed. It's like, no, you can have a character who... Uh, uh, perhaps is like a foil or perhaps has some other quality to them. Um, and even if it's like, oh, this is like a beloved backstory character for someone who is maybe not the most fun for them to be around, that's okay. The, it's like NPCs serve different functions. It, it, like when you're telling, when they're you're doing storytelling, these characters are your little tools in a Swiss army knife, so to speak. And not everybody needs to be that comic relief character who's going to be like endlessly you know, the PCs are going to them to clock their reaction to something. It can um, also be the, the result of their actions rather than the person. So like in my current campaign, my players met a rock and this yes. rock was an existential rock and they were able to convert it to, um, to good, which should not happen normally, but the player critted twice in a row. Um, and I was like, okay, you, you have turned the demon good, done and done. <laughs> Um, but the result of that is that Rock has now started flying around Avernus converting devils. Um, and so there's now a whole religion built around it, which is great. And I spent a bunch of time in one of my sessions having the players create the tenets of that religion and the symbols. And that became part of it. Um, so it doesn't even have to be about that Rock anymore. It's now about the result of their actions. So maybe you have the person who was the apprentice who's now the master because the old master wasn't wasn't doing it anymore wasn't able to to do their job or didn't want to or whatever you want to do so now the apprentice has risen up 
Um, so it's the result of the, the actions rather than specifically being the uh, the character that that was was supposed to be this huge I- impact. Yes, um, I think that's hugely helpful, and I think that. Um, uh, again, I would say as a DM in general, just like be kind to yourself, take pressure off yourself. Uh, uh, you know, n- not just by virtue of if you have a very successful character or an NPC that your players really love, don't make that your new bar. Like sometimes you're like, oh, they really like that NPC. Great, you succeeded. You can't have your highest success be the new minimum for what you are supposed to, to yeah, be doing. Yeah, you have to also have characters that aren't great for comparison, because then when you do meet the one character who everybody's eyes light up and you go, oh, this is the important NPC, now you have a reason for that person to be foregrounded uh, uh, rather than the other way around. A hundred percent. This next question comes to us from Rain Solo, uh, who's one of our mods. Thanks, Rain Solo. Um, uh, as we move to online games, what has been your preferred way to roll your dice? I love my click clacks, but sometimes math doesn't like me. Um, uh, the eternal virtual dice or physical dice when you're playing uh, when you're playing at home. Uh, do you have a strong preference one way or the other, Jennifer? Or do you? I, I love the D&D Beyond dice. I didn't think I was going to like them. And then they're actually super satisfying and they can do things that my real dice can't do. And they auto calculate numbers, which is wonderful for the speed of a game. But mm-hmm. when you're DMing, you need another solution. And so I do have, I mean, I do have my dice tower right next to me and have, you know, a case of many, many sets of dice nearby. Um, I don't think it's you have to always choose one or the other. You you can even flip between the two if you want. But um, in terms of an accessibility tool, having um, virtual dice can be amazing. And and yeah, with math, not everybody's great with numbers. Some people, you know, love the numbers. Some people really don't. And that that's a way to to save time and to to make that. And in case people don't know, you can actually use your um, phone virtual assistants to roll your dice if you need to. You can say, hey, insert your phone's virtual assistant's name here, uh, mm-hmm. roll a d20, and it will, and it will speak it back to you, so. Very, very cool, that's awesome. Um, I I think, like, why not have your cake and eat it too? I totally agree. Um, I find them, so we just shot a ton of Dimension 20 episodes all remotely. And I found myself going for the physical dice every time I had a huge bunch of bad guys with the same attack modifier. It was like, all right, we got eight of these little dudes that are all taking a swing, rah! And then you go and you, yeah, it's it's much easier to kind of assemble that out in physical space. Um, uh, also though, um, f- I like to roll in front of the board a lot. I'm a big fan of rolling in front of the board. I know some DMs want to keep everything behind the screen. For me, I really like rolling in front of the board for things that are that are going to be unavoidably bad or good, and you're immediately going to know one way or the other. The kind of thing of like, all right, this giant's hammer is coming down. Is you got three hit points left? This is bad. Like we don't gotta we don't gotta be coy about how this is going to turn out. Um, so the nice thing about virtual dice, especially if you're on a virtual tabletop, your roll 20s, other things like that, you're in a discord and you have like a dice spot in front of you that's going to be able to roll for them. You hit that, you go, okay, on a 13 or higher, it's bad news. And now all of us have that moment of being in time together, bated breath, and we have the group release as it either succeeds or fails. Yes. Um, is I think really, really gratifying because we, we love those moments of like, what on our show we call box of doom moments mm-hmm. where it's like, we're going to roll in the box of doom and it's going to be bad or good. And we're all going to know it. High same stakes. Time. High, High stakes. stakes stuff. Cause you, you, you got- want that, that to be collective. That's one of the places that, that tabletop shines is when you have those moments that are so high stakes and everyone's just, uh, uh, to, to have that together communally, collectively, collaboratively, um, and watch it happen, and then, or have someone go, wait a second, I have, like at the very last second, I have advantage, you know. Um, yes. <laughs> those, those moments are just so, that, that's what makes the game. 
Oh, I love that. We call that in my home game. We call that PC creep. That which that that little thing of of like you're about to narrate the bad thing happening, and someone goes, "Wait, I forgot. I have advantage." And then they're like, "Okay, advantage." And someone else is actually like, "Oh, but remember, you get that plus two bonus from this other thing." And we're like, "Any more? Any more creeping? Any more PC creeping that we're going to be adding to this before I get to exact my terrible will upon the party?" Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think ultimately when you're talking about playing virtually, it's what works for you and your table, which is always the answer with D&D, unfortunately. You know, people are like, how do you do this? It's like, well, it depends. Um, but if you if you love rolling in the open, you love virtual, you know, you're playing on a VTT, you're doing maps and minis um, virtually, that can be a great way to do it. If you just are caring about the numbers, um, rolling it, you know, privately is fine. Um, whether it's on a, a solid dice tower or on some sort of uh, character sheet or, or dice roller. Um, yeah, so it, it just, it depends on your group. Yes. What you're looking for. Um, I fully, fully agree. I think it's, it's, and that's something that I think too, like is not a bad mantra just for everyone going forward. Is like, uh, obviously in advice shows like this, Jennifer and I bring a lot of years of experience of this game, but again, we're not the people you need to keep happy. It's the people that are actually there at the table with you. Um, so the ultimate authority in this is always the well-being and good time of the people that are at your table. Um, uh, my goodness, an hour and a half has flown by. Um, uh, Jennifer, it has been an honor and a delight to have you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk with us today. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. <laughs> That's uh, fine. Oh, I love it. Talking about games. What could be better? Uh, gang, that's Adventure Academy. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back next time. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye. Yay. Woo.